Good morning, church. Good morning, church. Praise the Lord. It is, it is good to be before you today. He did call me uh, a hiccup. <laughs> okay, so what happened was that uh, the speaker that was supposed to be speaking this morning, uh, he didn't get the memo. And uh, we called to confirm the scripture reading. And he said, well, I'm not speaking today. So I stand before you today humbled to speak to you this morning. I am so thankful for God for blessing me in my life and giving me life, period. So standing before God, try to make it easy as possible to stand with pure mind, pure thought, and with a pure heart. So my lesson this morning that we will be presenting let us go to our Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we humbly approach your throne of grace to thank you for all the many countless blessings you have given each and every one of us. You have been better to us than we have been to ourselves. And we are thankful for your grace, your mercy, your goodness, your kindness. We thank you for blessing us in early existence to this present time. And we thank you for what you will be doing in our lives in the future. We will always honor you. We will always praise you. And we will always love you. This is our prayer in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Scripture reading. I would like to thank Brother Alex for doing the scripture reading this morning. That was an interesting version. I like that. But I'm going to be reading from uh, the New King James. The New King James, the passage, the scripture is taken from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. And the Bible says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through heaven, the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help us in the time of need. Brothers and sisters, we all facing different things in our life, tribulations, trials, up and down in life. We get frustrated sometimes. Anxiety builds up. We are children of God, but we have to remember that we have a high priest that will help us in our time of need. We have a high priest that we can go to when we need to connect with God. We have a high priest that will represent us in front of God. This is my child, and I love him. Forgive him. Keep him under your care. Be with him in his struggles. We pray all the time to God, or we should pray. We should be in prayer constantly. There are approximately 650 prayers recorded in the Bible. All of these prayers was prayed under different circumstances. Daniel cried out to the Lord to help the children of Israel on the battlefield at the war with the Philistines, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 7 through 9. Nehemiah prayed in the place in the palace of the king while in the king's presence. Jonah prayed in the belly of a big fish. Two men went up to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, the other was a tax collector. Jesus prayed in the garden of Gethsemane before he was crucifixion. Jesus also withdrew in the wilderness to pray. 
Jesus went up to a mountain to spend the night in prayer. And on other occasions, he took Peter, James, and John with him to pray on the mountain. Jesus also prayed on the cross. His disciples were praying in the upper room on the day of Pentecost after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. Acts chapter 1, verse 12 and verse 14. Stephen was praying while he was getting stoned. Can you imagine that? Praying while he was getting stoned. He prayed for his executioners and prayed for himself. Peter went up on a rooftop to pray. Devout women, including Lydia, met regularly to pray by the riverside. Acts chapter 16, verse 13 through 14. Paul prayed by the seashore with the Christians at Tar before he bid them farewell. He also prayed on the ship that was being in danger of being wrecked on rocks. His prayer was a prayer of thanksgiving for the bread they was about to receive. Paul prayed by the bedside of a sick man and healed him. There are many great prayers throughout the Bible. Prayer is a great privilege enjoyed by the children of God. Repeat that. Prayer is a great privilege enjoyed by the children of God. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16 through 18, the Bible says, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ for you. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 through 15, Jesus says this, In this manner, Therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us of our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptations, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men of their trespassing, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespassing, neither will your Father forgive your trespassing. Some people call this prayer the Lord's Prayer or the model prayer. I would like to refer to it as a model prayer because Jesus is teaching his disciples to pray by giving them a pattern. This prayer is offered according to a pattern and we can see this in the phrase in the beginning that says, in this manner pray. That suggests a pattern for this particular prayer. In this prayer, we see reverence for God, for his name, for his being, and his character. It is a prayer for progress of God's kingdom and his will be done on earth. This prayer is asking for physical necessities and spiritual needs. It also is a prayer asking for forgiveness of sins. It is a prayer for action for protection and deliverance from the evil one. It's also a prayer for praising God. This prayer is offered with a merciful spirit as indicated in the pattern itself. We cannot expect mercy for ourselves if we don't show mercy for someone else. How many times would I forgive my brothers Seventy times seven. There was a very important statement that Jesus made in this prayer. It's part of the pattern. He elaborates on forgiveness, forgiveness, forgiveness in this pattern. 
this is a great and powerful prayer, but I don't think, me personally, I don't think it could match the highly priestly prayer that's found in John chapter 17, verses 1 to 26. Have your Bibles, please turn it to John chapter 17, verse 1 through 6. 1 through 26. The title of this lesson, we want to put a title on it is The Greatest Prayer Ever Prayed. The Greatest Prayer Ever Prayed. A question might be asked of me. What is it about this prayer in John chapter 17, 1 through 26? It makes this prayer so great. I'm going to give you four reasons. In John chapter 1, we see that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John chapter 17, this prayer was great because of the person who offered the prayer is great. Jesus is re revealed in the Gospel of John as he who was with God, he who was in the beginning with God, he was with the creator. He was the creator of all things. He was the light or is the light of the world or the light of the men. He who became flesh dwelled amongst men. John chapter 1, verse 14. Jesus proclaimed in this gospel of John chapter 1, he proclaimed himself as the Word, the Lamb of God, John chapter 129, the Son of God, the King of Israel, the promised Messiah, the bread of life, the light of the world, the great I am, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, John chapter 11, verse 25. The resurrection and the life. He gives life to all men. The prayer in John chapter 17 is great because the greatest person who ever lived is the one offered. The prayer in John chapter 17 is great because the person, the greatest person ever lived, offered it. Period. It's great because of the occasion that demanded the prayer. Special occasions provide weight with words. Special occasions provide, provide weight with words. On July the 20th, 1969, an American astronaut, Neil Armstrong, 240,000 miles above Earth, speak these words to more than a billion people that was in their homes listening to his words. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He said this while stepping off a lunar landing module, Eagle. Neil Armstrong became the first human being to walk on the surface of the moon. This was a very important event, and more than a billion people listened to it. If Neil Armstrong had been made, if he had made this statement while playing hopscotch in his backyard with the children in the neighborhood, it wouldn't have had much weight to it. Nobody would have been interested in it. But he said this on the surface of the moon. He made, so he was the first man to walk on the moon and make that statement. So the situation helped give weight to his words, being the first man on the moon. The occasion surrounding this prayer in John chapter 17, notice the first words that Jesus says, Father, the hour has come. John chapter 17, verse 1. Now somebody might ask me, what hour is that? Well, let's turn to John chapter 16, verse 32 to 33. 
Jesus asked them, do you now believe? Indeed, the hour is coming. Yes, it has come that you will be scattered each to his own and will leave me alone. And yet I am not alone because of the Father is with me. These things I have spoken to you that in me you might have peace. But in the world, or in the world you would have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. It was a time of Jesus' separation, betrayal, suffering, and crucifixion. It was a time in which Jesus, when God's eternal powers and purpose was to be executed, the design of God from the beginning of creation was being executed in the Son, Jesus Christ. It was a time when Jesus was about to bear the sins of the whole world on the cross. This, this occasion which Jesus know, knows his crucifixion is imminent. He knows that he's going to die on the cross. So this gives weight to his prayer that he requests. You know, people, when they're by the bedside and they're about to die, they always, you know, we always we make confessions, you know, make statements. This was one that Jesus had made in this prayer. Whatever preoccupied the mind of Jesus at this time must have been very important. Genuine prayers often reveal the person innermost being. John chapter 17 is in a unique opportunity to see the nature and heart of Jesus. Everybody with me? Everybody with me? Say amen. The prayer was also great because of the contents of the prayer. This prayer deals with great themes. It takes us back and forward in time, back to the eternity past, beginning. It takes us forward to the future of heaven. In John chapter 17, verse 24, Jesus says this, Father, I desire that they also whom you gave me may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory which you have given me. For you loved me before the foundation of the world. So it deals with glory, the glory of the Father and the Son. It deals with disciple glorifying God on earth. This prayer deals with the Son giving glory to his disciples. It gives the disciple that seeing the Son in action. It discusses love the Father's love for the believers and the Father's love for the Son, Jesus Christ. This prayer contains great partitions. He says, glorify me, keep them, sanctify them, that they all may be one, that they may behold my glory, the one and begotten Son of God. This prayer has three great divisions. Jesus prays for himself, he prays for his apostles, and he prays for the believers. We're believers, present, past, and in the future. He prays for everything, covers everything. So even a brief examination of the contents reveal the greatness of this prayer. And that's why I think it's worthy of a farther study. If you have time, study it a little bit more. You see that it's a great, powerful prayer. And it will enrich your lives because it is so powerful. And it is given by the greatest person that ever lived, Jesus Christ. 
So the fourth reason this is a great prayer is because there's victory revealed in this prayer. The concerns of Jesus is evidence. He said, pertaining to the world, it's used 19 times. And it's effect, and, and it's effect that can have on believers. The world can have effect on believers. Amen. It can. This is a justifiable concern because we live in a corrupt, crooked, distorted, blah, blah, blah world. Put the word in it. Put your own statements in it. But we have a high priest that is able to help us. We live in a world that is deceived and blinded by Satan. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 3, the Bible says, even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. People close their eyes on, on God, whose minds the God of this age has blinded. The God of this age blind people that can't see, who do not believe, at least the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. They're blinded. For we do not preach ourselves, but Jesus Christ, the Lord. And ourselves, we are bond servants for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commands light to shine out of the darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That light shines if we open up our eyes and see who God is. To see his magnificent power, to see his radiant glow. If we open our eyes and let him shine in our hearts, we would be better off. The world would be better off. We live in a world which is dangerous. Promises are fulfilled in some people's lives, but it will pass away. First John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17 says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the lust of it, but he who does the will of the Father, through the will of the Father, is what we need, is what you need. We live in a world which is defiled. And it's defiling those that accept this world and everything that it offers. In James chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Here's the key. And to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Keep oneself unspotted from the world. The world has a way of drawing us into it. We had mentioned earlier that we are blinded by the lust of the flesh, the high pride of life, everything that goes with it. Jesus has overcome the world. He told his disciples prior to his, his prayer in John chapter 16, verse 33, he told his disciples this. John chapter 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Praise the Lord. That is so great because we can live on this promises, standing on the promise of God, standing on the promise of him. That is so good. So this victory is revealed in this prayer. The world may be deceived, but Jesus has shown us the reality in revealing the only true God, John chapter 3, 
Oh, I'm sorry. John chapter 17, verse 3. The world may be dangerous, but Jesus provides security as we are kept in God's name. We are kept in God's name. The world may be defiled, but Jesus provides sanctification through God's word. John chapter 17, verse 17. Sanctify them by your word, for your word is truth. Need to get in God's word, see the truth in his word. The world may be divided, but Jesus offers unity in his glory. John chapter 17, verse 22. Jesus glorified the Father through his whole life from his circumcision and dedication at the temple. Luke chapter 2, verse 21 through 23. He even glorified God in, in his quiet years of obedience in Nazareth. Jesus glorified the Father through his faith, obedience, and his work through the years of his earthly ministry. Every sermon preached, every blind or sick person he healed, every bit of instructions and training for his disciples, every confrontation with the corrupt religious leaders, every question answered, every love and touch, they all glorified God the Father. You have been redeemed, but you must still be kept. You have been regenerated, but you still must be kept. You are pure in heart and mind, but you still need to be kept. Stay. Stay kept under the guidance and the love of Jesus Christ. Be there. The New Testament tells us that Jesus has an ongoing present work and intercession in our lives. Ongoing. Romans chapter 8, verse 34. And Hebrews chapter 7, verse 25. He's praying for us, asking God the Father to keep us. Jesus has not left us on our own efforts. The world, the flesh, and the devil are so mighty, so passive, and so seductive that we could never keep ourselves on our own effort. We will crumble. We all can't stand up against the spirit of, in the dark ages, the forces that's behind it. We cannot do it. We must hold on to God. We must rely on Jesus. We must stay with Jesus because he has prayed for us. He has prayed for us to keep us. He said, Father, keep them. Father, keep them. Say, Father, keep me. When you're in distress, say, Father, keep me. Keep me grounded, rooted in your word. Our prayer, that's his prayer, echoing throughout the ages, throughout the time. Conclusion of this lesson. I gave you four reasons why we should appreciate this prayer in John chapter 17. It's been called the greatest prayer ever prayed or the high priestly prayer. It is great because of the person who offered it. It's the greatest person ever lived. The occasion that demanded the prayer, the contents of the prayer, and there's victory revealed in this prayer. Through prayer, we can find peace that guards our hearts and our minds. Philippians chapter 4, verse, seven, verse 4 through 7 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made to, to God, be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind through Jesus Christ. Will guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ. Not the world, but through Jesus Christ. Guard your hearts and your minds. 
through prayer, we can receive mercy and grace to help us in time of need. Our scripture reading was Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 through 16. As disciples of Jesus Christ, we should do all that we can do to see that the greatest prayer ever prayed be fulfilled in our lives. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20 says, all power and authority has been given to me. This was Jesus before he went up to heaven. Therefore, go make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and in the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything that I have commanded you. And lo, I will be with you, 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 to the very end of age, all of us, the believers. Prayer is a privilege, I think. It's powerful in itself. We need to recognize that. We need to be in line with God's word to keep us under his care. There might be someone that might not be under God's care or feel that they're not under his care. Well, there's information that's left in the scriptures that tells us that we should talk about God. We should talk about the gospel of Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection. We should talk about how God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We should tell them that God did not send his son into the world to destroy the world, but through him the world might be saved. You have heard those words. You must believe those words. You must repent of your sins. And you must confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He did come down to the earth to die on the cross for us. And then we must be baptized, have all of our sins washed away. And we rise up to be a new creature and walk daily in the love and under the guidance of God and under the care of Jesus Christ. And he will continue to pray for us in intercession before God. He'll say, this is my child. He has fallen, but we can help him up. You promised that you would take care of him. You were confession of Jesus being washed and baptized like most of us have been. But for those who haven't, Come to the gospel, listen to the gospel, obey the gospel, be washed and cleansed of your sin, and God will grant you a place in heaven. You, will, you can be with him, and you can see his prayers as you pray to him be fulfilled in your life. Whatever your concern is, if you would like to, more information about how to become clean and washed of your sins, you can come to me afterwards, after this service, and I'll explain it more deeply. For those who take God for granted, you can ask for prayers, and we will pray for you. I say granted, but say we fall short sometimes, and we might not believe like we want to, you know, or like we should, and we need prayers, so we all pray for you. We're family, so we'll pray, and ask God to strengthen you, to continue to protect you, continue to guide you, continue to help you, continue to give you strength in your life. Whatever your need is or whatever your situation is going on in your life right now, you can make it known to us and we will pray for you and we will cater to your needs. Thank you for listening to me. As we close now, we will have the invitation song that is presented this time.